Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Charles C. Shaw speaking. KTSA is honored this evening by the presence in our studios of two great men, the Honorable H.G. Wells, world-famous British historian, author, and student of world affairs, and Mr. Orson Wells, the genius of stage, screen, and radio. This is the first time that Mr. H.G. Wells and Mr. Orson Wells have appeared together. In fact, they met for the first time only yesterday here in San Antonio. But this is not the first time that their names have been linked. Two years ago, Mr. Orson Wells adapted Mr. H.G. Wells' book, War of the Worlds, for radio purposes. And you know the rest. Revising the story somewhat, Mr. Orson Welles depicted an invasion of the United States by men from Mars. Although he explained it numerous times during the program that it was fictitious, the country at large was frightened almost out of its wits. Men called radio stations offering to enlist against the Martians. Others were panic-stricken. The realism of the production, frightening though it was, was a tribute to Mr. Orson Welles' genius. And thus the name of Welles, H-G-W-E-L-L-S and Orson W-E-L-L-E-S, became linked. Mr. H.G. Wells, in the opinion of many, is the world's most famous man of letters. He has come to San Antonio to address the United States Brewers Association, and Mr. Orson Wells is here for a town hall forum address Wednesday. In this meeting of great minds, I feel rather inconspicuous, and the less I have to say, the better you listeners will like it. But first, could I interest you gentlemen in a discussion of Mr. Orson Wells' broadcast of Mr. H.G. Wells' book, The War of the World? You're turning the meeting over to us, sir? I am for the moment. <laughs> He's turning it over to us. Well, I've had uh, uh, a series of the most delightful experiences seemed to, since I came to America. But the best thing that has happened so far is meeting my little namesake here, Orson. <laughs> I find him the most delightful uh, uh, carrier. He carries my name in an extra E that I hope he'll drop sooner or later. <laughs> See no sense in it. And uh, I've uh, known his work before he made this sensational Halloween uh, spree. <laughs> Are you sure there was such a panic in America or wasn't it your Halloween fun? <laughs> I think that's the nicest thing that... Uh, mm. that uh, uh, a man from England could possibly say about the men from Mars. Well, because, uh, uh, Mr. Hitler made a good deal of sport of it, you know, and sp actually spoke of it in the great Munich speech, you know. Mm. And there were floats he, in Nazi he parades. Had much showing. else to say. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> he had much else to say. <clears throat> and it's supposed to show the corrupt condition and decadent uh, uh, state of affairs in democracies that the War of the Worlds went over as well as it did. I, I think it's very nice of Mr. Wells to say that. Uh, not only I didn't mean it, but the American people didn't mean it. We, that was our impression in England. We had articles about it, and people said, have you never heard of Halloween in America when everybody pretends to see ghosts? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, uh, there was some excitement caused. I uh, really can't uh, belittle the amount that was caused, but I think that the people... Uh, Got well, over it very quickly, don't what you? What kind of excitement? Mr. H.G. Wells wants to know if the excitement wasn't the same kind of excitement that we extract from a uh, practical joke in which somebody puts a sheet over his head and says, boo, I don't think anybody believes that that individual is a ghost, but we do scream and yell and, and rush down the hall. Mm -hmm. And that's just about what happened. That's, that's a very excellent description. You, you aren't quite serious in America yet. <laughs> you haven't got the war right under your uh, chins. And the consequence is you can still uh, play with ideas of terror and conflict. You think that's good or bad? It's a natural thing to do until you're right up against it. So it ceases to be a game. And then it ceases to be a game. Well, now, uh, here's a thought. Some of Mr. H.G. Wells' writings are termed fantastic. And a few years ago, well might they have been conceived such. The shape of things to come, which told of a long Indonesian war, was such a fantasy. But, Mr. Orson Welles, do you think that it's so fantastic in view of today's events? It certainly is not so fantastic. And the, the one question that Mr. Mr. Wells has uh, spoken of, not only in the shape of things to come, but has uh, hinted at or directly prophesied a, uh, such a state of affairs following a, uh, a wasting war and a return to a feudalism from which uh, the world would find itself again. And uh, today in Mr. Wells's lecture, he said uh, quite the most interesting thing that uh, uh, I've heard in a long time. He said that he'd 
commenced just recently to ask himself if there was any reason why mankind should so uh, uh, emulate the phoenix and should so uh, get itself out of uh, its mess. He proposed a couple of, uh, of uh, solutions, but he did admit that there, that there was a possible excuse for a gloomy point of view mm. and that it would be good to be realistic about it and not to uh, dismiss the gloomy point of view anymore. Perhaps uh, uh, the time had come to look ahead since the future, uh, Mr. Wells's future, which we've always adored and never uh, really understood, is suddenly upon us. Mm -hmm. And we are living right now in that uh, famous H.G. Wells future, which mm -hmm. we all knew about. Now, before we get away from this microphone, tell me about this film of yours that you've been producing. Uh, you're a producer, aren't you? You're That's right. art director, you're everything. Well, Mr. Wells. What's the film called? It's called Citizen Kane. Mr. Citizen Kane, yes. Citizen. Not C A I N. No, K-A-N-E, and this Kane. is, of course, the kindest I... and most gracious possible thing to do, Mr. Wells, is to making it possible for me to do what in America is spoken of as a plug. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he understands the fine old American I subject. don't understand these words, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, you understand the, uh, uh, the value, however. Mr. Wells wants me to tell you that uh, I am, have made a motion picture, and he is kind enough to ask me a leading question concerning it. I am looking forward to it. <laughs> You're very kind, sir. It's a, it's a new sort of motion picture with a new uh, uh, method of presentation and a few new uh, technical uh, uh, experiments, a few new, new uh, methods of telling a picture, well, not only from the point of view of writing, but of showing it. If I don't uh, misunderstand you completely, I think there'll be a lot of jolly good new noises in it. <laughs> 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 I hope so. I think it's jolly good new noise. I said, what the motion pictures could, stay, could uh, well afford these days. I, I hope you're right, and I hope there are some jolly good new noises. I can think of nothing more desirable in motion picture. I'm all for some jolly good new noises. Well, wasn't it you, Mr. Orson Welles, that uh, presented for the first time in modern times plays without scenery and settings in your That's Julius right, Caesar? yes. And they, well, they were not... Well, the, now, uh, there's no yes. such thing as a play without settings because there's now, got to be something behind an actor and you've got to look at something. Very simple settings. I, I had an extraordinary experience once. I saw uh, uh, Ellen Terry's son. What was his name? Ellen Terry's son? Yes, mean, his uh, production of Hamlet. You mean you're good? Uh, no, no. Gilgood is a relation of the terrorists. No, no, no. Um, yeah. Never mind his name for the moment, but I saw Hamlet produced in Russian in Moscow. Oh, the Stanislavski production, was no, it? No, no, the... Uh, uh, this I know nothing about. I know. I, I'm sorry. Awfully well, sorry. Yes. And that was done with screens, don't you know, That's and right. nothing else. And it was done in Russian. I know my Hamlet pretty well. And all the time I thought I was listening to the English play. Do you understand that? Oh, yes. Yes. That was a great show. Yes. Mm. What do you think the effect, uh, what effect do you think this war, or any war, will have or is having on the arts, principally the theater and literature? Well, now, in a country that is fighting hard, as Britain is doing, the arts go into a temporary rest. Uh, the, uh, but I think if we come out of the war, then there will be great renaissance because we shall have a greater sense of reality, less uh, respect, don't you know, for tradition and the uh, old-fashioned way of looking at things. Oh, I agree so much. I think it, may, it means if Great it purge, I if think. If it doesn't war. mean disaster, this war, it may, means a tremendous renaissance of the human mind. And a new approach to realities in, the, in terms of the arts. Of course, now in America, we go through the worst possible stage in the arts because we are not ourselves engaged in the war, and the war is, is only a kind of conception in the newspapers for us. But it has affected us sufficiently to degrade the taste, and we're going through that, that period in, during, of, of uh, mild war hysteria, which means a degradation of standards in the arts, particularly in the theater arts, 
but a, a tremendous boom in the financial aspects thereof. As if people are rushing into the theaters, but they're rushing into the wrong theaters to see the worst kind of pack. Mm -hmm. uh, after we get into the war, and if we do, and after we get into uh, uh, the kind of trouble that we're bound to get into if it isn't precisely the war that we're speaking of now since the war becomes a new war every week. But after we get into whatever it is we're going to get into, the same thing will be true of us, I think. And uh, our arts will go into uh, a temporary decline. But again, uh, any sort of success following this war must make a whole new uh, approach to the arts possible. It's always a great purge, I think, in, mm. in, the, in the visual arts and in the theater arts, particularly in letters. What happens to our democratic peoples is first is the shock. Yes. And then after the shock, they pull themselves together. Mm -hmm. And we've had the shock, and now I hope we're going to pull ourselves together. And that means politics, war, uh, art, everything become more rational, more powerful. We should take a step forward unless we take a step backward and go over the precipice. Do you think that that shock is due to a lack of discipline in a democratic country as opposed to a totalitarian country? Oh, no. Uh, oh, good. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so great. Uh, discipline is a word for children and... Uh, you know, people who have to salute and that sort of thing. Grown-up people do want to live freely and largely. Therefore, any group of gangsters who get together and give themselves wholly up to getting power have a temporary advantage. Mm -hmm. You know, you've been through the whole of this thing on a small scale with... Uh, uh, your your gangsters here who've had for a time a reign of terror. They terrorized... And a very district. real discipline in their own ranks. Yes, yes. discipline they is the word. Mm -hmm. Law of the pack. Fear discipline in their own uh, ranks. But directly your democracy said, this is too serious and we can't let it go at that. You dealt with them. We have to deal with this air... Uh, assault on civilization now because it all comes through the air you know mm -hmm. and until we've got a world control of the air this sort of thing may come back again that's the thing that we have to stop well do you think that uh, this uh, faculty that makes people get shocked this trait that makes them get shocked is a sign of adulthood as compared with a more childlike attitude on the part of those who are under totalitarian I, rule i think adult people want to live their own lives try experiments with life, do this and that and the other thing. And therefore, any sort of criminal who chooses to uh, concentrate on terrorism gets a temporary advantage. And you can't cure that. The grown-up world uh, is at the mercy of the criminal until you've developed a method of dealing with the criminal. But a method can be developed. Naturally, there's a momentary period of surprise because we're not, by the very nature of our way of life, we're not equipped to deal uh, with what is foreign to our conception of a way of life. So that the, uh, the first shock must necessarily be very great. Mm -hmm. If you have a happy village of people doing this, that, and the other thing, and you get a dangerous lunatic who begins to go about terrorizing the whole village, it's a great nuisance, but you have to pull yourselves together and suppress that lunatic. That's what civilization has to do now. And for a moment, speaking of your business as a shark, for a moment, of course, there is a, everybody is merely appalled. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and during that period of, of, uh, of uh, mere uh, shock and mere terror, uh, the criticisms against democracy sound very valid indeed. But uh, we know that... Uh, Mr. Wells's community is going to uh, pull itself together and going to deal with this lunatic. Well, do you think, Mr. H.G. <clears throat> Wells, that Britain's reverses, early reverses, may have been due to that initial period of uh, shock and that now they're over I it? I think that our people could not believe that a whole nation could go, grow so mad as the uh, Nazi socialists. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they said, 
Poor dears, they must be dreadfully distressed about something. Give them something. Appease them. What is the trouble? But you see, the more they appease, the more yes. frightful the attack. Because you can't appease paranoia. Every, every uh, psychiatrist uh, uh, in the world, in any court mm -hmm. of law, can tell you that the way to deal with paranoia is not by appeasement. And, uh, but we didn't have any psychiatrists in, uh, in uh, power politics at the time. We simply had sort of, sort of uh, goodwill and uh, futile humanistic mm -hmm. world. Well, this thing has to be settled now. It has to be one dread that I have is appeasement. More uh, some attempt now to call this fight off before it's fairly finished. You back up the British because we can beat the National Socialist. We don't want a single American to die as an American soldier in Europe. But don't get in the way when it comes to a settlement. <laughs> don't let them off because uh, this has to be a decisive fight. And at yeah, the yeah. end, We've got to have all the world disarmed so far as the air goes, because there'll be no peace until there's a complete control of the air by the civilized forces in the world. Who do you include as among the civilized nations, Mr. Well? Well, the three nations that can put over peace in the air at the present time are America, the British system, and Russia. And if you can make friends with Russia, Russia is a very difficult, fickle country, and you may find a lot of difficulty in making friends. But if you can work Russia somehow important. with the Russian, then you can now make peace in the air for all time. Well, wouldn't you have to appease Russia? Why appease Russia? Why appease Russia? She's I don't understand such a question. Well, well, to yes. recognize no. her conquests. What conquests? Of what? the uh, Baltic countries and now, Finland. Listen. Wait a minute. Listen, <laughs> listen to that. <laughs> we English have had a lesson about that. We let the Germans push their airports right up to the English Channel. We let them put guns that can fire into Dover. We had our time over again. We should certainly have bombed Berlin when we were right up on the French frontier. And we should have taught them the mischief of trying to make war in somebody else's country. Now, the Russians have done nothing but push back the German bases so that they can't do a blitzkrieg on uh, Moscow. This has been and misrepresented as imperialism. Which is, of course, absurd, because if Russia was bound for imperialism, which is inconceivable anyway, considering the internal, internal economy of Russia, they certainly would have behaved in a very different way. How would America behave if you had, uh, um, if you had guns commanding the approach to New York on Staten Island? If you had a brave little foreign country in New Jersey? If you had... Uh, Nazi bases creeping up through the French colonies, cre creeping up through uh, South America, so that presently it would be quite an easy job to bomb New York. Would America wait for it? Is America waiting for it today? No. What you are doing as fast as you can is pushing back any possibility of getting bomber planes over America. By uh, that you refer to our air bases yes. in the Caribbean and the Atlantic. Yes, and in uh, preventing any settlement of an air base anywhere that can threaten. That's the obvious policy. Have the Russians done any worse than that? Aren't the English now bitterly repenting? That they didn't bomb Berlin when they could have bombed uh, Berlin quite easily? and that they've allowed the German bases to uh, uh, creep forward so that every night we get the raiders over the mouth of the Thames and that sort of thing. You see, learn from us. Mm -hmm. If you learn from us, you not only find your own policy clear, but you also see the reason that 
good, sound, common sense of the, the Russian action with regard to the Neva and with regard to the Kurzon line. Well, Mr. Orson Wells, don't you agree that the press and other uh, mediums of public opinion in this country have painted the Russians pretty much villains? Oh, naturally, and appallingly so. Well, we sure I mean, the foreign correspondents working on American uh, wire services are emotionally unprepared to deal sensibly and uh, in a neutral and, and, uh, and decent way about the, about the whole Russian business. And the, the press represents, for the most part, vested interest in America, and therefore the whole Russian picture has been... Uh, has been so falsified as to uh, uh, make it almost impossible to discuss with the uh, ordinary intelligent American the Russian position. It's a great tragedy because perhaps the, perhaps the hope of the world is some sort of alliance with Russia. I'm not speaking of a communist revolution. Understanding, speaking, understanding. But an understanding, with, an understanding with the aims of Russia, no matter how much we may quarrel with the administration of, uh, of, of, of uh, the Russian ideal. After all, it's not too foreign from the democratic ideal. But the democratic ideal has chosen to divorce itself from this, in the, and, and this choice has been made by vested interests, by people uh, who, who, who shake with terror at the mere mention of any sort of, uh, of uh, equity in, uh, in world affairs. Well, didn't you say today, Mr. H. G. Wells, that uh, Russia was uh, considerably Tory even yet? They haven't... Uh, Use the word Oriental Toryism, which is a very Oriental interesting Tory. phrase and needs a good deal of... Uh, but all uh, the same, they have every interest in the world in coming to uh, some arrangement for the suppression of air war. They don't want it. They've got much too big a part of the earth to develop themselves, to want territory in Europe. The administration of, of, the, of, of the socialist state in Russia is, after all, none of our affair. We may criticize the Ogpu, and we may not like the, uh, we may not like the personality or the methods of Mr. Stalin, but the, the fact remains that there is happening in Russia something which is in the direction of progress. We cannot deny progress. If we do, we step backward, and stepping backward is suicide. Mr. H. G. Wells, I understand you've written a new book. Yes, I've uh, Very great book. put a lot yes. of... Orson's a good fellow. <laughs> <laughs> Sensible, <too. laughs> discerning, yes. <laughs> yes. No, that's, that's true. yes, I've tried to do the mental attitude of very, two very clever young people, two university uh, students, uh, towards the world, how the world looks to them and what problems they have to face. It's a book for the young, about the young. And and it's about a very young world. book. It's very, <laughs> thank you. And what is the name I, of your book? I, I think book for a man that I've only met <laughs> in two days, Arson's a very loyal cousin of mine. <laughs> <laughs> what is the name of the book, Mr. Wells? Babes in the, the, the ba Babes in the Darkling Wood. Is Not it? Babes in the Wood, but Babes in the Darkling Wood. Because is it it's realistic good. or any fantasy in it? Oh, no, it's quite realistic. They just uh, talk away at their troubles. Most their of problems. Mr. Wells' novels are realistic, but it's a, it's a misconception. It's a... Uh, it's assumed that a man who could say that the air arm of a country is the most important thing about a country in the future, that such a madman must mm. certainly write nothing but fantasy. Yeah. Well, gen <laughs> well, gentlemen, it's with great reluctance that I have to say our time's up. This has been one of the real pleasures of my life. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to Mr. H.G. Wells, the famous British historian and author, and Mr. Orson Wells, the theatrical genius, who met for the first time in San Antonio yesterday and have honored us with their presence tonight. To you, Mr. H.G. Wells, and to you, Mr. Orson Wells, my heartfelt thanks for your kindness.